So I want to welcome everyone to our webinar, Making Sense of Online Marketing for Retail. Now, for years, we've really been talking about the importance of online marketing and the foundations. We've been talking about email, websites, social media, online listings, and creating content or content marketing. Now, over the last few months, I know a lot has changed. But really, the foundations of marketing are really haven't changed much at all. It's only really intensified now that the Internet has become our main conduit for interacting with each other. Now, I'm sure a lot of you know online marketing really is an opportunity because people are out there. They're searching for products and for stores like yours. Stats actually show that 69% of people are searching for local businesses at least once a month. Now we're also seeing about a 250% growth year over year in the last two years, and that's for mobile searches. People are searching for terms like on sale or near me. And then 180%, or we're seeing 180% growth in the last two years of mobile searches for the phrase online shopping. So what this means is that people who are online with their businesses, they're seeing growth. 43% of business owners are exp experiencing significant growth when they uh, are selling online. And then 46% of ev Evergreen shoppers, they're making their purchases online via a mobile device. Those are all important pieces that are going to play a role in what we're talking about today. Now, we at Constant Contact, we really understand that the world of online marketing, it can be confusing and overwhelming. And there are tons of tools out there and never ending ex expert advice. Now, we know that you don't have the time to sit down and figure it out all out and understand what online marketing should mean for you. And that's really what we want to help you with today. We want to help you to understand and navigate online marketing and make it simple for you. And one thing I want you to remember as we're going through the session today, the holidays are going to be here before we know it. And it's just going to happen in the blink of an eye. So you really want to make sure that you have these foundational elements that we're talking about in place. And that's going to help to make sure you're prepared for the busy season. So let's take a look and see more specifically what we're going to cover in today's webinar. I want to start by talking about how people are going to find you online, how you can set yourself up for success, and we'll be talking about five tools that you want to have in place, and then how it all comes together in the end. Before we get into all of the details, I just want to put a face with a name and introduce myself a little bit more formally. My name is Stephanie French, and I'm the content manager for webinars here at Constant Contact. And I'm really excited to introduce Brian Kaplan, the CEO of Brian Kaplan Marketing. He is an expert in this industry, and he's got a lot of information he's going to be sharing with us today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so let's go ahead and start by talking about how your business is going to get found online. I want to start by talking about this whole idea of word of mouth. Now, in today's world, we're seeing that a lot of times this is happening online. A lot of it's happening due to social media. But could you talk about how this is happening a little bit in more detail and why it's so important to online marketing? Oh, of course, because as you know as retail business owners you know that a customer comes into your shop or they go on your website and find out more information about your products if they have a wow experience if you've delivered them with a quality experience then they're going to tell their friends conversely if they did if they didn't really have an up to par experience or a stellar experience they might tell their friends as well so we're going to focus today on positive word of mouth on people having such a good experience that they're going to share i mean you've pulled up a great example here People are turning to Facebook and specifically Facebook groups for, for towns or cities where they're asking people, do you know a service provider or do you know a shop where I can get this? And actually, I told you, Steph, before we started, I'm in the middle of a move. So I joined a group up in New Hampshire where I'm moving to where I'm asking questions about all different kinds of things. And my new neighbors are feeding me information and really practicing word of mouth to tell me where I can go to you know, really resolve those needs that I have. That's a great example there. And what I want to say is it's not so much just being online. It's you've got to be there and you've got to be a part of that conversation as well. That's certainly going to help you to be more successful online. 
So word of mouth is just kind of one way that people are finding out about your business. And I want to break this out. Technically, there's a lot of different ways it can tie into each other. But another way is someone's going to go out there and they're going to do a search online. Running a search is, uh, when people do that, they're going to be looking for a business, someone that they can, uh, that shows up as reliable and trustworthy based on all these different things that show up in those search results. And there's a couple of different ways that someone might go about doing that search. They might search for your business name if they know about your business already, or they might search by a keyword or a phrase. What I wanna suggest that all of you do is to follow these examples a little bit later. You can run your company name in a search and then also search for things that you should be known for and make sure that you're showing up. So let's see a little bit more specifically what shows up in this example. So if we search by a business name, Brian, do you wanna tell us what exactly these things are that are showing up? Sure, so what we're doing when we're searching for a specific business name, it's a branded search, right? So we are looking for the business name. We know the business, we just wanna find out more information about them or figure out how we can purchase from them. So what you're seeing here is called the search engine results page or the SERP, S-E-R-P. And this is the page that everyone's delivered to once they type in keywords or whatever they're looking for on Google. And so the first thing you see is organic results. Now, this is actually one of my clients, so it's really cool that we're showing this. This is Meyer the Hatter. They're the largest hat shop in the South, five generations of hat makers and hat sellers in New Orleans. And so their website's showing up. You can see some information that, that they're showing for different pages, some images that they've created or that are on their website or on social media. They have some ads in the top right where they're selling some of their different hats. And then we also see Google My Business. So in my other life, outside of you know working with Constant Contact and doing a lot of email marketing, I'm a speaker for Grow with Google, and I teach people about Google My Business and specifically how they want to get their business showing up in that little box right there on the the uh, third of the screen, where we can see images, we can see reviews, and all of this good stuff that makes us just a little bit more comfortable to buy from this hat shop. Google My Business is such an important tool. If you haven't set one up, I definitely suggest it. And the reason being is because it's taking up a lot of real estate in the search results. And for free. Very true. Now, another way that people might find out about your business is actually by running a search for something like hat shops near me or something similar. So these results look a little bit different and I was hoping you might be able to walk us through what all this means. Sure. So what you're seeing right here when, when we're saying Google Maps, this is actually called the local pack or the three pack. And again, these are businesses that have created and verified their Google My Business profile. So you guys are going to have a way to get in touch with me and to find out more information. One of the things you can do is attend other webinars where I teach you about Google My Business and also watch our past webinar on listings and reviews that we had. I'm sure we'll share the link for that. But what you're seeing right here are the top three businesses that Google thinks should show up when someone's searching for a hat shop near me and they're in the New Orleans area. You'll see that Meyer the Hatter shows up and they actually have 216 reviews, four and a half stars. So the fact that they're in the top three is huge. They're getting pole position. People are seeing that they're recommended by Google if someone's looking for a hat shop. So this is actually really, really powerful for a small business or a retail shop like one of you. Definitely. Yeah, back in February, Brian and I actually ran a webinar specifically for listings and reviews. Rachel or Dave, I don't know if one of you could go out to the YouTube page and grab the link directly to that, but I think that would be an awesome thing for our audience to be able to reference later on if they want to learn more. Oh, definitely worth your time. It's a great extension of what we're talking about today. Absolutely. Now, if we scroll down in those same search results, um, can you talk about what we're seeing here? Sure. So all of these are organic listings, right? So that means Google is basically going around the web and they're finding information from these businesses, whether it be a website or as we're seeing right here, business listings. So of course we see Gorin Retail Store, which is in New Orleans in the French Quarter as well. And so they're showing up, but then we're seeing Meyer the Hatter, their website. We're seeing that they're showing up on other listing sites. The more sites you're showing up on, the more listings you can acquire, especially if they're free, the more people are experiencing your brand, they're seeing your brand, and the more apt they are to click on your brand over someone else. 
Definitely, you want as many opportunities as possible to show up in those search results. And the right. tools that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes will really play into that. So as we start to wrap up this section, I really want you to keep in mind that when people do this search results, they're going to start to click into those results and they want to know whether you offer the right product for their needs. They want to know, you know, are you good to do business with or are your reviews in the tank? Maybe I don't want to do business with you. The thing is you want to make sure that the information that they're finding in those results is really putting you in the best light and answering any questions they have about when you're open or how they can buy from you. They're going to be forming some opinions about you and how you do business. Super quick. Definitely. Now that all leads us into the second section. So in, here we're going to talk about setting yourself up for success and five tools in order to do that. So what are those five tools? Well, first and foremost is a mobile responsive website. It's got to look great no matter where someone is viewing it from on their desktop computer, which has a large screen or on a mobile phone, which of course has a really skinny screen. And then of course you want an email marketing tool a primary social media channel so you can start to communicate with people and just another opportunity for people to find you. Up-to-date business listings where you're collecting reviews and making sure your information is out there. And then of course, an easy way to create content. So we're gonna break it down and talk about each of these five tools. But before we do that, I know you've mentioned, Brian, that buyer persona is important here. Can you talk about what that really means and how it's gonna play into all of these tools? Yeah, so guys, you know, folks that are here on the webinar, the big thing is you've got to know your customer, right? So most of you, if you're in a retail setting, you get to really know and talk and build rapport with your customer. You got to take that a step further. So now we have to basically extrapolate or kind of guess like who is our ideal customer? And that's where a buyer persona comes in. So a buyer persona is defining your perfect customer. The perfect, the woman, the person, whether it be man, woman, whatever, that walks through your door and is going to buy with no objections. They won't give you a hard time. They get the thing, they put it on the counter and say, ring me up. So building a buyer persona is important, not only for that, but we're looking at <clears throat> when we build your website, what kind of messaging are we sending to them? What kind of experience do we want to provide? When we're sending out email marketing, what's going to make them click and buy from us? When we're setting up our listings, what are they searching for? And all these other tools that we're going to look at, buyer persona is going to be a constant theme. So you see me here, now you're seeing double vision, but one thing that we have is the ability for you to build your own buyer persona. I've set up a free marketing community. It was really in response to COVID to help small business owners like you. You can join the marketing community by going to briankaplan.com slash join. The first thing we'll have you do is build your buyer persona so that now you're marketing, you have a good foundation, and now we can start figuring out your messaging to really get them to buy. That is so important, really making sure you're targeting the right people and making sure the message applies to them so that they pay attention. It's mission critical, it really is. Definitely. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, each of these tools and we'll start with the website. Can you talk about the role that a website plays in retail and why it is so important? Sure. So a website, you know, it, there's different types of websites, right? With a retail store, what we're trying to do is one, we're trying to give them a brochure or an idea of what the experience is going to be, what products you carry, uh, if you provide any services based on those products, if there are certain brands that you carry. So we're really painting a picture of what the experience is going to be. A lot of you, or at least some of you, may have pivoted and now you have a shopping cart on your website. So you may also be listing the different products you offer and you're making them available for sale, which is absolutely brilliant. We want to do that so that we're making it easy for the customer, whether they feel safe enough and they feel good going outside and coming to your store, or if they want to sit in the comfort of their own home and go on your website and buy, we want to basically tend to all of those customers and make sure that we can get your product in their hands as quickly as possible. Definitely. Now, thinking about that and in terms of the website, what tips do you have to create an effective website that's going to facilitate more sales? Sure. One thing that we want to do is we want to keep our primary call to action top of mind. So when I say call to action, guys, that means what are you trying to get them to do? Again, when we talk about buyer persona, we're trying to get them, we're sending out messaging, we're pushing out content, we're pulling a response like a mime. We're pulling that rope. 
right? So what type of response, what action do we want them to take? That's gotta be front and center. Do you want them to call your shop to find out more information? Do you want them to email you? Do you want them to go to your shopping cart and start buying stuff? Or do you want them to start looking through a catalog you have? So all of those different things really play into your call to action. The number one primary thing you want them to do. I'll say for a lot of you, uh, considering we're on a constant contact webinar, I will tell you one of the best things you can do from your website is to grow your email list. Honestly, someone comes to your website, maybe they're not gonna take an action. Maybe they're not going to actually click on a button or buy something. But if you can get them on your, I didn't even know the slide was next. If you can get them on your email list, if you can actually sign, get them to sign up and they give you their name, their email address, maybe a phone number or what they're interested in, oh God, now you have the ability for you to actually send them one email, two emails, three emails, four emails. You get your products in front of them again and again, and pretty soon, guess what? They see it enough, they want it enough, they're going to take action and buy from you. Yeah, it's absolutely your ability to begin to contact them on your terms and have an influence on them later on. Now, the website is just one place you can collect email addresses. Do you want to talk about some other list building ideas? Sure. I mean, first and foremost, ask. So if you see someone that comes into your shop, the worst they can say is no. The worst you can do is not ask. So you've got to ask them. If you have employees, make it a challenge. Tell your employees, hey, whoever gets the most email addresses during their shift might get a $25 bonus or a gift card or something like that. Make it fun so that there's some competition. But you should bake it into your training process and make sure your staff knows to ask for the email address. The other thing, you've probably seen it before, hey, enter in to win something. So it might be a raffle or a drawing for a product or a gift card to your shop. Easy way to grow email addresses. And I'll tell you, an email address is worth quite a bit. So it's worth it if you're gonna put it out for 25 or 50 bucks or something like that. Uh, obviously, we're seeing the sign up form that you can pop onto your website. This is great because it's capturing people when they're on your website. If they've clicked to your website, right? So they go on Google, they're looking for a certain product or service or your business, they go to your website, and now you're saying, hey, I wanna send you more information about my business, my products, does that sound good to you? And look at this. I want you to keep note of what the offer is. Sign up to receive 20% off your next order. Okay, so you're losing 20% off the top. That's fine, but guess what? You're not, you're not getting them to sign up for the first sale. You're getting them to sign up for the second order, the third order, the fourth order. And that's where the money really is in your email list. Definitely. You have the ability to turn them into repeat customers with email marketing. Definitely. Now, I want to have Rachel share a link to our our guide, Making Sense of Online Marketing for Retail. This goes into a lot more detail about a lot of the tools we're talking about today. But if you're looking for more tips to really build your website and making sure you're getting the information and the content just right, we've listed out some questions for a bunch of the different pages that we suggest that you have on your website. And it's really kind of just a step-by-step -step process for you and makes it super easy. And Steph, let me add two more if you don't mind on yeah, growing the list. So of course, another one, social media. If you have followers that are engaged with your brand, put it out there. Maybe once a week, once every two weeks, say, hey guys, give them a compelling reason why they should join your list. That's a great way to convert followers to subscribers, which is very important. And the other one, we talked about Google My Business. In a Google My Business profile, you're actually able to put up a little post and it lives on Google in your profile. So I recommend whenever I'm working with clients, I tell them, hey, when you put up a post, maybe once every other week, ask people to join your mailing list. You're getting your email subscription button right there on Google. That's a powerful thing to grow your list. Google My Business has so many powerful tools and reasons you should use it. And that's just one of kind of the extra bonuses in my eyes. Exactly. Now let's talk a little bit more about email marketing and the role that that plays. How can retail stores effectively use email in their strategies? So one thing that retail stores need to, and, and the folks on the webinar need to really keep in mind is that email isn't just to sell. Email is to build a relationship in the inbox. Okay, so what you're trying to do is you're trying to build awareness of new products you have. Maybe you're trying to share what goes on behind the scenes, right? So some different content that might talk about how you're sourcing your products. What's the inspiration for your products? How are they made? 
all of these things. People are curious to know more than just what's the price. They want to know what goes into it. Uh, email is about sharing your own story. We'll talk about the power of the story in a little bit. But people love story. They love, they connect with you even more because all of us have story wired into us. It's how we learn. It's how we grow. It's how we share and transfer things. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you see promotions. And of course, the promotion works really well. We actually, with Meyer the Hatter, we used Constant Contact and we sent four emails in four days. And it was a long weekend right before uh, Easter. And it was the same promotion. We were giving 20% off hats. And each email was saying, hey, open this up for 20%. We changed the subject line. We changed the content a little bit. But the call to action was the same. Click here, use this code, save 20% off. And I'll tell you what, when we, when we planned a promotion out and it was deliberate, we actually got $5,000 in sales during COVID with an email campaign through Constant Contact. $5,000 of hats. Who buys hats during a pandemic? So that's one. Then you also have the idea of being a helpful resource of building the community around the brand. So it's got to be a mix. Now we see up at the top, we want to send at least once a month. Listen, guys, if, if you are actually putting in the time and the resources to grow your list, once a month is the bare minimum. My suggestion is to send at least twice a month, okay? And the cool thing about using a tool like Constant Contact is you can create the email and schedule it for later. So wake up at 6 a.m. on a Sunday, brew your coffee, sit down, think about your buyer persona, what they want to receive in their inbox, make the two emails for the month, schedule them out, and then you're done. Ron Popiel said it and forget it. Move on to other things. Definitely. And I love your point of variety. I see way too many retail stores, especially bigger brands who are just doing promotions. And if you actually gave me some value, I would pay so much more attention to the emails that you're sending me. So such an important yeah. point. Now let's move on. Let's talk about social media. Can you talk about some sure. of the more effective social channels for this industry? Sure. I'm First and foremost, we've got Facebook. It's its its own country, right? It's huge. It's billions of people on Facebook. So you can't ignore it, okay? You need to have a presence on Facebook. The way that search works, and we were just showing you the search engine results page and talking about Google. Google is the number one search engine. YouTube is number two, and Facebook is number three. So people are going onto Facebook and they're looking for products, looking for services, looking for a business, like in like you guys in your certain category in retail. So keep that in mind. Facebook is big. You want to have a good Facebook page, but and with Facebook pages now, you can create groups. So you can actually go in, you can join a group as your business page, or you can create your own group as a business page. Don't bite off more than you can chew. One thing you might want to do is just join a local group. For instance, where I'm moving up to in New Hampshire, there's a group for the town that I'm moving to. You could join that page as the business and then share some fun stuff, not just selling and promotion, but also, you know, curate some stuff, funny videos and all that stuff just to get your brand out there. Really, really good way of doing that. Twitter, as you can see, it's what's happening now. Now, Twitter requires you to stay on top of things. It's not just like, let's put out a tweet and then forget it for a week. Tweeters and people on the Twitter network are expecting that you're going to be in the conversation. So my suggestion there is if you have the time, you love having your phone and you have a little, maybe, you know, you have a little time to yourself that you can go and do things, then you want to do Twitter, but you've got to be doing it every day. It's got to be a habit. Otherwise, you're not really jumping into the conversation. Instagram is another one where you guys should be. Instagram is a great way to show your products, especially if you have visual products and you want people to, to look at them. Uh, Instagram is great for video content as well. You can post up up to 60 seconds for a video for Instagram, or you can do Instagram Live where you can do it longer. Instagram is very, very effective. It's owned by Facebook, and you can actually integrate or match up your Instagram profile with your Facebook page. And when you post something on Instagram, automatically jumps to your Facebook page. Really good way to be more efficient and minimize your time spent on social. Pinterest, Pinterest again, very visual network. What you're doing is you're putting up pins. So let's say that you have an e-commerce website, you're selling your products. You could create pins out of those products. A pin would be the photo of the product and a link back to your product site. For instance, we work with a company called Walpole Outdoors. They sell 
they have retail products like wind chimes and birdhouses and things like that, but they also sell really big products like pergolas and fences and gazebos. We use Pinterest. We're getting half a million people looking at the brand every single month because we're always posting up visual stuff and people and all those pins are linking back to the Walpole website. Great way to drive traffic. And YouTube, I mean, I can't say enough about YouTube. YouTube, again, second most used search engine owned by Google. If you're creating videos in YouTube, you're having a chance to show up in the search results when people are looking for your products. And one of the best ways that you can use YouTube, it's, it's simple, but here, look, you see this? Oh, wow, doesn't that look cool? Look at that. Okay, hold on, hold on a second, look. Oh, wow, it's a microphone. Do you know how many people watch these videos because they're curious to see what's in this thing? Unboxing videos are some of the best ways you can get people looking at your products and sharing them. I've never That's done great. that before, by the way. <laughs> it was perfect you had me enticed. <laughs> there you go, so it's a microphone. Yeah, you've got to really match that social, uh, the content you're putting out there to the social media channel. That's something really important to think about. Now, yeah. something I see a lot of small businesses doing is not really knowing what kind of content to put out there that's going to get them results. Could you talk about some things to think about there? Sure. So, I mean, when we're looking at these three different types of content, awareness is getting people to recognize your brand. So depending on the social channel, there's different ways to be found. Um, one thing that a lot of social channels use are hashtags. So you guys have heard of hashtags. It's the pound sign. It's the number sign. And then you put a word and that's where you're getting into a conversation about that specific topic or subject matter or product. So with this, with the hammock, right? That looks like a really cool hammock. I might do a hashtag of outdoors or enjoy nature something like that so that people that love nature love outdoors maybe love camping hashtag camping they might find my product that hammock and then they're going to go to my profile go to my site and potentially buy it engagement is where we're trying to get people to like comment share now a lot of you probably use facebook the thing that you don't want to do for a business is just click like likes are there it's nothing right a like is just an easy thing if you want to support a business, if you know other business owners, the way you can support them first is by choosing a heart or a wow or one of those because it shows that you actually clicked and held and tried to choose a different social icon. The other thing you can do is comment. It takes you time to type on a keyboard. It means that you took the time to actually get engaged. And this is what you want your customers to do or your prospects as well. Put up a picture and ask them, hey, caption contest, or what do you think's inside this box, or what would you do with this product? Get them to engage with you. The reason you want engagement, their friends see that they're engaging with your brand. Now you're getting more eyes, more visibility on your brand and your products. Action, hey, listen, if we're trying to drive action, we might have a promotion or a sale or an offer. It might be an exclusive offer. So again, think back to where I was talking about Meyer the Hatter and how we made $5,000 in hat sales in a pandemic before Easter. Well, we could have made some Instagram ads if we were running their social media and said, don't miss out. You only have a limited time, use this code and it would be a graphic where we're trying to drive action from the consumer. All of these though, awareness, engagement, action are useless if you don't have a buyer persona, if you don't know who you're talking to, right? Because otherwise you're just shooting from the hip and you're hoping it makes sense. But right now, that's what you want to do. Buyer persona and then think about these different types of topics, these different types of posts so that you can really create a conversation around your brand. Definitely. And it's important to remember that with social media in today's world, people, consumers are constantly going out to a social media channel if they've got a problem or a question. So uh, I think that's another way that engagement really ties in as well is you want to make sure that you're there and you're paying attention so that you can put your best foot forward, help that person. And then, of course, other people are going to see that you're being helpful and you really care about customer service as well. The, the best way you can be a fixture and build some brand resonance is by adding value and giving people what they need and really being being someone of a thought leader so that they look to you like, okay, now when I need this product, I'm going to go to them. Absolutely. Now, the next tool that we want to talk about is using listing and review sites. And we've briefly talked about Google My Business already, but could you talk about what other kinds of listing sites are important for retail? 
Sure. This is something that we really focus in. This is like my baby. I love listings and reviews. So Google My Business is obviously the listing profile for Google. It's owned by Google. It's a tool that's given to you by Google and it's totally free. All of you that are retail business owners need to have a Google My Business profile right away. But then there are other listings. Of course, there's the Facebook page, right? The Facebook business page, different from your profile, okay? So some of you may have a personal profile and you're representing your business on there. That's not a listing. You need a Facebook, a dedicated Facebook page, your company page for your business. Also Yelp, love them or hate them, Yelp's around. They allow you to collect reviews. They're a little bit more difficult to collect reviews because people are supposed to feel compelled to leave you a review. You can't share the link to your Yelp listing because Yelp will say, uh-uh, and they'll filter out those reviews. But then there are others, there's City Search, there's Better Business Bureau. And then specifically for you guys, there might be Yellow Pages and all these other listing sites. The important thing to know, when Google is going around, so here's, let's walk through it a little bit. I go on and I'm looking for a specific, uh, a specific thing. Let's say I'm looking for a new grill for my new house, okay? So you guys have a retail store, you're selling grills and patio equipment, all those things. So I'm gonna to go to Google, I'm gonna look for a grill in New Hampshire or a grill store in New Hampshire. Well, Google is gonna go through the web very, very quickly. One thing it's gonna do is say, okay, does do these companies have a website? Do these companies have Google My Business? Okay, two things. Do these companies have consistent information around the web? What I mean by that, and if you wanna write this down, it's called NAP info, like taking a nap, N-A-P. N-A-P stands for name, address, and phone number. And throughout the web, no matter if you're on Facebook, Google My Business, Yelp, Better Business Bureau, City Search, doesn't matter. Your business name needs to be the same, your address needs to be the same, and your phone number needs to be the same. Those are, it's like the holy trinity for Google, okay? So you need to make sure that information is consistent around the web. If it's not, you kind of get these demerit points, like almost like, okay, your, your information isn't consistent, you might not provide the best, most detail-oriented wow experience for these customers. Therefore, we're gonna show another business that is on top of their profile and on top of their business information. So again, these are some listing sites. There are plenty more. And also you guys will get my email address or you'll be able to join my community. If you do so, I can show you the other listing sites that would work for your business. Definitely, and it it really just comes down to those minor details, but they are so big when Google is looking at it. You know, if you're abbreviating your street address or you're using parentheses when you're right at your phone number, it's those little things that count. Spot on, and even one, a lot of people will either do like my company LLC or just my company. It's got to be one or the other. So you've got to choose, be deliberate, and then go with it on every listing site. Definitely. Now, what are some of the other key pieces or tips that retailers need to think about for listing and review sites? Sure. And let's think about, you know, you mentioned it. We're coming up to the holiday season. You guys should already be strategizing for the holidays. People start shopping next month. They're going to start shopping next month. They're going to be looking for gifts because especially now there's what we call time fluidity. You don't know what day it is, let alone what hour it is. People are on their devices so much more looking around for different things. They're going to start shopping in September so that they have everything ready for the holiday so they can send it out early. So another important piece for you are reviews. So you have your listing sites, but then on certain listing sites like Facebook, Google, Yelp, you've got to collect reviews. Reviews have to do with this idea of social proof. Social proof is this psychological phenomenon. And social proof basically states, the, the whole principle of social proof, monkey see, monkey do. If you went and bought from this company and you share your experience, give them five stars and say, this was wonderful. The salespeople weren't pushy. They set me up with the product I needed. They even gave me a discount or a promotion. And I was so happy. My thinking is, okay, I don't know who you are, but if you had a good experience, then I most likely will have a good experience. And that's where reviews are really important. And search engines like Google don't even, don't just look at your star rating, you know. So you want anywhere from 4.2 to five stars to be considered a really good business. But also they're looking at the volume of your reviews. So how many reviews you have in total. So let's say you've been a retail store that's been around 10 years. You shouldn't just have three reviews. 
otherwise, what, who are you selling to? Like, are you, do you really have customers? You should have a lot of reviews. The other thing Google looks at in search engines like Google, the cadence or frequency of reviews. So not only should you have a high volume of reviews, you should be getting new reviews every month which means you should be asking your customers for reviews. You should be asking your customers for feedback. That also signals to search engines like Google that you're alive and kicking and you're totally relevant when people are looking for your products. Definitely, all good points. You've got to make sure that you're on those review sites and paying attention and collecting those reviews. It's not enough for you to just fill out the information. Now, I want to move on and talk about content, which is the last tool. Content is really what people search for, they consume it, and then, of course, they can share it online, which ultimately helps you to drive traffic from search. Now, you've mentioned mm -hmm. the power of story. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how that really helps a business? So, think about it, right? When we're little, we're taught fables, and fables have morals right so you're you're learning something there's a key takeaway but as kids we're you know if if you tr if i just tried to tell you don't do that you're not going to listen but if i told you this story and then i said hey what do you think they learned my three and five year old bryce and olivia will look at me and be like you know what this is what you should do so right away story is is just hardwired into us from a young age I've got books, like I read them the Dr. Seuss books, I read them Roald Dahl books, I read them Goosebumps, I read them Harry Potter, and they love listening to those stories. They're caught in, like we're really just brought into this story. We, we either love the character or hate the character, we wanna see them win or lose, there are plot twists and all those things, and we feel like we're part of it. Great example, never ending story. Never knew there was a sequel, there was, and it was okay, but the first one, you love watching it. You watch Bastion and you watch Atreyu and all these things and you're just into that story, right? So with sales, story really plays well. Instead of pushing, pushing a product at someone and saying, here, take it. Nobody wants that. If I said, here, take this microphone. Look at this. You can plug it into your phone. It's great. You see that? That plugs into your phone. Look at this. You talk into it. Are you really listening? Or if I said, imagine you have the most amazing product and you want everyone to know about your product but one thing that's really important is that they can hear you people need to hear what you have to say i'll tell you what sometimes it's really hard to hear because your phone you might be blocking your microphone but i'll tell you what here's the deal if you take this little bad larry right here you plug it into your phone it's going to provide you with the best audio you could imagine and now you can tell stories about your products, you can share customer testimonials, and everyone will hear the audio clearly. How's that sound? So it's telling a story about the product instead of just saying, here it is, it's a microphone. And we have, this is actually a really good example because many of you have probably used Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace or Let, Let It Go or one of those where you're trying to either sell a product for cheap or get rid of a product. So this is an ugly brown couch. For whatever reason, we chose this color years ago. I don't know what happened. My wife blames it on me, I blame it on her. But we had this ugly monstrosity in our basement. Now, it's a great couch, it's easy to clean, it's micro suede, it's been, you know, hasn't really been used much, has good cushion and everything. So. We are moving, as I told you. We don't want to bring this couch with us. We've already brought it to one house. We don't want it anymore. So let's go to the next slide and look at how my wife tried to sell the couch. Gently used, seven foot long, brown, micro suede sofa that folds out into a bed, but without a mattress, doesn't have a mattress. Okay, already like the deal killer. Lightly used, light brown sofa from Cardi's. Okay, Cardi's is a good brand. Pulls into a full size bed sold for over 900, I'm giving it away for free. Please note, you'll have to buy an air mattress for it. First come, first serve, must wear mask, all this stuff, we do social distancing, okay? Are you really pulled into that? Crickets, posted it up, my wife was looking at me, she's like, no one's responding to this, we're trying to get, it's a, it's a couch, like it's beautiful. Not really, she knows it's ugly too, but she was really trying to push it, play it. So we heard crickets. That's when I took over. Okay, first, before that, Linda would push out, this is my wife, Linda. It's free, 
Come take this away from me. Did I forget to mention that this seven foot micro suede sofa was free? Very clean too. Desperate, desperation. And I was laughing so hard. And she looked at me, she's like, you think you can do it better? I said, challenge accepted. So here's what happens after the crickets. I brought the ugly monstrosity to life. Now, if you've never seen Mr. Bean or Seinfeld, I'm sorry, but you should recognize one of these two cast characters, okay? What I did, of course, I can do some graphic design. So I took Mr. Bean, I popped him on the couch. I took the Seinfeld cast, I put, popped them on the couch. And then I created a story about the couch. TV fans rejoice. This celebrity couch has just wrapped up its final season at our house and is looking for new opportunities. Famous stars like Mr. Bean, and the Seinfeld cast have dreamt of sitting on this couch, but they can't pick it up soon enough, so now it's for you. Smooth feeling of the easy to clean fabric allows comedy genius to begin brewing in mere minutes. In fact, in fact, some of the best dad jokes of 2019 and 2020 have been created on this couch. Spoiler alert, this couch turns into a bed. That's right. This cutting edge technology was imported by the most brilliant minds in Switzerland who were able to fit a bed inside a couch. Plot twist. A three-year-old boy who shall remain unnamed thought it would be good idea to poke the air mattress with a pen repeatedly. As a result, the air mattress character was pulled from the show, but there is space for its understudy. The bed can fit any full-size air mattress. If you need somewhere to park your keister for a Netflix and chill night or full rebinge of Sopranos or Fresh Prince, we've got you covered here at the Kaplan House. Go ahead to Love the it. next slide. Let's see what happened. 730 listings of an ugly couch, six listing saves of an ugly couch, nine listing shares of an ugly brown couch. And then I started getting messages Brian, I don't need a sofa, but if I did, I would buy yours simply for the comedy gold description. You should write everyone's FB marketing. Now, of course, hold on a second. Of course, I'm in marketing. I should be able to sell a couch. I don't need this, but best ad ever. Ha ha. This woman, great way to sell. Well done. I got so many messages from people saying, I don't need a couch, but this was great. Power of the story. And guess what? Someone grabbed it. I didn't have to do any desperation, talk about it being free. Someone saw that post from all the social sharing, word of mouth, and that ugly thing is out of here. So my friends, that tells you the power of story. So Stephanie, if you wanna talk a little bit more about content creation. Yeah, definitely. So really what I wanna say is uh, I think content really should all, all start on a blog. So can you talk about how someone should determine what kind of information or topics they should even write about? Number one, buyer persona. Put your, so there's a couple things. Put yourself in their shoes, put your mind into theirs and figure out what are they thinking? What kinds of questions do they have? So think about your frequently asked questions, okay? What are people asking again and again? Um, what are their needs right now? Okay, do they need a product that's gonna make their life simpler? Do they need a product that's going to give them, uh, th that's going to keep their kids engaged for 30 minutes so that they can veg because they've been in the house with the kids the whole time. So we wanna start thinking about what kinds of things they wanna read. And of course, starting with a blog is great. And I'd even challenge you to go one step further, start with a video and pop it into your blog. So even do YouTube and then take that video, pop it onto your blog and then share that everywhere. What we do with my company, what we do with a lot of clients, video, blog, email campaign, and then we put it out on social media. And we're getting tons of love for different clients because people love watching video too, if they don't wanna read. But here's the thing, like Steph wrote, search engines love fresh content. They need to see that you're keeping up with the times, that you're answering questions that people have, that you're talking about what people are interested in. Also with your blog, if you're writing it in the right way and you're writing it for your buyer persona, then you're showing that you have thought leadership. Thought leadership means you know what you're doing. You know your industry, you know the products. If you're selling interior uh, furniture, right? Or wall decorations or window decorations, then you've gotta be up with the trends. What's going on? 
right? So we want to make sure that we're showing people that we know what's going on. Helpful content, of course. Hey, listen, some of the best content is content where you're helping people to figure out how to do something. How to fix my Keurig coffee maker. Hey, if I sell Keurig coffee makers, great. I'll show you how to fix it too so that you can get a little bit more life out of it. But guess what? Once you start doing it, you realize I just need a new one. You'll get the old one, you'll put it on Facebook Marketplace, whatever, and then you'll get a brand new one. And finally, answer questions. Some of your best content comes from the questions that you get frequently. It's honestly, if one person asks you, then that means 10 people are thinking it, they just haven't asked you yet. You just said exactly what I always say. If someone's asking you, there's someone out there online who's gonna be searching for that. So answer it on your blog, get in those yep. search results. Very true. So I wanna make sure we have enough time for questions, but this next one is really a bonus and it's definitely something you want to start to think about once you've got those five tools set up and you can amplify your efforts, add a little fuel to the fire. It's paid ads. Brian, could you talk a little bit about some of the ways that people might use these ads in order to grow their business? Sure, so number one, what I'll say is this and what I say to anybody, make sure you have your fundamentals down your buyer persona so you know who you're writing the ads for, your website should be built out, uh, make sure you have your local listings all set up, okay? Those are big things. Then when we're looking at ads, of course, every platform sells ads. Google has ads, Facebook and Instagram has ads, Twitter, Pinterest, LinkedIn, they all sell ads because, you know, at the end of the day, that's a huge revenue source for them. With Google ads, there are product ads that show up, you can see the different um, jeans or, or pants that are there and it's a little square and then you have information, you have the title of the product, the price and people can click through to your site. Those are great. If people broke a heel and you sell shoes or footwear, then they might go on and look for, you know, orange heels or whatever they're looking for. And if you have a product ad there, you have a chance of showing up. Google also has text ads. Text ads are really powerful too. If someone's looking for a specific product, maybe you have a little bit more of a, a complicated product, you might start with, hey, learn more information about this product, okay? So Google, the one thing that I'll tell you guys, for those of you that are just getting your feet wet, Google offers smart campaigns. It's a, a really easy way to build out ads. Uh, you basically choose your business category, you can then choose some different products that you wanna showcase or keywords that you wanna show up for. And Google really takes care of the heavy lifting. Really big thing about ads, specifically for Google, I'll tell you, you only pay if someone clicks on your ad or calls to your shop through the ad, that's it. So even if you made a budget that was 150 bucks a month, right? And only three people clicked on your ads. You'd only pay for those three clicks. That might only cost you 10 bucks or five bucks or seven bucks, depending on how uh, competitive your space is. So that means you didn't pay $140 that month. It gets rolled over to the next month. And then your budget state resets at 150. So just know that ads are really powerful. They're a great way to show up with Google at the top of the search engine results page. And they don't cost you an arm and a leg. Then when we have social media ads, Again, we've got to think, what is the buyer persona looking for? How do we get them? How do we get them to basically look at the ad and react to it, whether they're clicking on it, liking it, sharing it, commenting on it. So we've really got to think like, what is the image we want to use? Or what's the video we want to use? What's the headline we're going to put on there? How are we going to write in a little description to really kind of pique their interest and get them to actually interact with it, to click? And that's where anytime you're doing ads, test and you've got to measure. I always say, if you're not measuring, you're not marketing. You've got to be looking at the metrics. Don't just throw money at it or boost a post for 20 bucks. I know a lot of people that do this. Hey, let's boost this post for 20 bucks. We're getting some likes on it. You got to measure it, see what's coming out of it. Are people going to your site? Are people calling the store? Are they coming in? And are they buying stuff from you? Don't just throw money blindly. You really have to measure your ads to make sure they're working for you. Definitely. And I do want to mention that we, among all of the tools that we have in Constant Contact, websites, email marketing, we've also got really uh, simplified ways to create these types of ads in Constant Contact as well. So let's go ahead 
And just quickly recap these five tools that we've talked about here. Again, these are the foundation before you try to start running ads because you've got to make sure you've got the foundation in place. Of course, a mobile responsive website, email marketing tool, social media, up-to-date business listings where you're collecting those reviews and putting your information out there. And then of course, an easy way for you to create content and utilize that power of story. So we're gonna run a poll, but I'm actually gonna skip this for now and let's uh, we'll do it at the end while we're starting to ask questions. So let's see how this all comes together. So we definitely wanna make sure that you're taking action. And of course, this is again, making sure you're getting that foundation in place. Make sure that you have a mobile responsive website. If you're not sure if your website is mobile responsive, go out and view it on your mobile phone. Do you have to scroll left and right or all over the place? That's not the best user experience. So first and foremost, make sure you've got that. And then make sure that you're setting up your website as a potential resource for customers. Use that link to the guide that we sent out earlier, and that'll walk you through making sure you've got the right information on your site. And then don't forget to utilize the power of email marketing. You wanna collect email addresses not only on your website, but in a lot of the other areas that Brian talked about. So uh, Google My Business, you know, and just asking, that's like one of my biggest rules, just ask people for their email address when you're doing business with them. And then of course, you've got to start to use email. So Brian talked about using promotional email and that's what a lot of uh, retails businesses do, which is great, but you've also got to have that exclusive helpful information that really shares your expertise and shows your value to your audience. That ultimately helps you to stay top of mind and in my mind really build relationships, which is important for you as a small business. And then on social media, often I see a lot of businesses that feel like they're too busy to actually interact and engage with people on social media. And I think that's one of the biggest rules. And you wanna make sure you're using social media to create posts. You wanna drive awareness, create some engagement, and then also drive action and get those results, get those sales. And then of course, listings and reviews. Like I said, and Brian said before, it's not enough to just put the information there and let it remain stagnant. You've got to go out there and maintain those reviews over time. You've got to ask people to leave your reviews and then you've also got to interact with those reviews as well, really helping you to build trust with people. Last but not least is the power to amplify your efforts using paid ads. There's Google ads and even social media ads to help you maybe reach new customers and drive business. One of the other tools I don't think we mentioned with the Facebook ads and, and constant contact are lead ads. All of the time I get questions from people, I want to be able to reach people in say a 20 mile radius and I want to get them on my email list. Well, there's your answer right there, lead ads. So I know we went through that a little bit quickly, but Brian, is there anything else you'd like to leave the audience with today and especially maybe thinking ahead and planning for the busy season? Well, we just dropped a lot of knowledge on you in a very short time. So many of you are probably just like, where do I start? Buyer persona, know your customer. Then you start looking at holistically at your brand, how you're showing up online. Everything we're talking about today is what I call digital presence. And the thing is you can chip away at it. So one thing that we that Constant Contact created is the download specifically for you, and it gives you sections. It's sequential. It talks about everything we talked about today, and it really so that you guys can print it out. What I recommend, print it out, highlight the areas, make notes, annotate it, and basically figure out how you're going to really start building your brand and building a strong brand that people can see, can interact with, and can buy from. Those are the big things. Definitely, and we'll have Rachel share that link again in the chat window in case you missed it from before. And Brian, I'll put a, up your slide here if you wanna tell the audience a little bit more about your offer before we get sure. to the questions. So I am on a mission. I'm literally on a mission. I'm like the Blues Brothers. I'm on a mission to help 10,000 small business owners get found online. With As being a speaker for Grow With Google, I get to meet and present to thousands of people, but it ends after 45 minutes or an hour. 
So what I did is I created the free marketing community, completely free. We provide you with resources. The first thing, like I said, you build your buyer persona, which is so mission critical. And then we start exploring how you can build up your website, how you can improve your email marketing. We even give you ideas on email marketing. We talk about social media, checking your listings online. Basically everything we talked about today is drip fed to you through the marketing community. And you have the ability to reply back to an email and ask me a question. I read every single email. I probably get 200 emails a day and I'm happy to answer all of them when I have the time. But the first step, go to briankaplan.com slash join. Once you join, you'll actually be greeted with an email where you can build your buyer persona. Definitely. So let's go ahead and get to, it looks like we only have a few questions in here, uh, which is great. I, I think that probably means we did a good job explaining things today. Before yeah. we get to the questions, I just want to note that when we close out of the webinar today, you're going to get a survey that pops up on your screen. If you could just take one or two minutes and tell us what you thought about the webinar today, that would be very helpful. So I want to address this whole idea of email frequency a little bit more, and I know you touched on it. Could you talk about, uh, so we mentioned sending at least one email a month. Could you elaborate on that? I know in a lot of different industries we're seeing, you know, uh, sending maybe a little bit more frequently to certain types of people on your list because you know certain types of things about them. The first thing that you guys need to think about and I, I've seen this a lot. Business owners feel like, oh, if I send an email, I'm going to annoy them. You've got to take that out of your head. You've got to get that out of your head. If someone joined your email list, they said they wanted to learn more about your business, your products, your services. They've expressed that, right? Especially if they've gone on your website and signed up. Now, that being said, some of you may have looked at uh, buying a list. Never do that. Never, ever do that. It's really bad for your account. It's really bad for your reputation and it's not going to give you the results. These people need to opt into your list. That's number one. Number two, you are not annoying them. And if you think, okay, I'll send one a month and then that'll be okay. Don't forget people are being stimulated everywhere. This thing right here, people are looking at it at least 150 times a day, if not more on average. Okay. And they're not just looking at emails, they're looking at text messages, they're looking at social notifications, all these other things. So if you think that sending one email a month is going to annoy them, it's not the case. You need to get on the radar. That's where I say at least twice a month, right? So that you're getting your brand in front of them. A great feature that I love, that I absolutely love, I used to have to do this manually, but this, this idea of if people don't open your email, you can resend to them. So you resend to did not opens. Here's why that's important. One, if you send out an email and you have the subject line and you know 20% open it, you can automatically resend to those 80% that didn't open with a new subject line and try to get them to open too. You're maximizing exposure in the inbox and you're giving more opportunities for someone to click and interact with your brand. So, so important. So what I do is I challenge you guys, send at least twice a month. Uh, there's obviously overkill, right? So if you're sending twice a week or three times a week, you're going to see that your subscribers might not like that. You might have more unsubscribes. But if you do increase, let's say you send twice a month, three times a month, four times a month, and it's good content, it's informational, it's educational, it's entertaining, and a little bit of promotion or sale, then I will tell you guys you have a really good chance of driving in repeat sales and getting more revenue. Definitely. You hit that on the head, you know, different things that are happening, different uh, types of customers. So I think we've hit all of the questions. There really wasn't a lot, um, but I would love it if you would take just a few minutes to uh, complete a poll for us. We would really love to know where you're seeing yourself spending most of your marketing focus for the rest of this year and into 2021. So maybe it's email marketing, social media, paid ads via Google search ads or paid per click, direct mail, or something else. If it's other, uh, you can uh, tell us in the questions window what you're planning to use for the rest of 2021. And while everyone is completing that poll, I don't know if there's any other, uh, any other tips or suggestions you want to leave the audience with today, Brian. Sure. I, uh, the thing that I'll say is make time for your marketing. You guys, right now, of course, uh, 
I can't, I don't know what each individual on this webinar is going through. I know that all of us are going through challenging times. I saw research that, you know, 80,000 small businesses just shuttered, but at the same time, if you're still in business, if you have a customer base and if you've provided a good experience, then getting in touch with those customers, getting them to buy from you again or share the share the word, spread the word about your business is a great way for you to continue growing and thriving in this otherwise just very abnormal year. So put time into your marketing. One thing that I always tell my clients to do, listen, schedule it in. If you have a calendar, you swear by Apple Calendar, Google Calendar, whatever it is, take an hour every week and look at your marketing and figure out ways that you can improve it, ways that you can get out in front of people and ultimately get that brand in front of them so that they're thinking about you when they need your products. Very, very important and really mission critical to the success and the survival of your business. Definitely. I really love that point about planning because otherwise we get so busy running our businesses that we don't sit down and really think about it. And you hit another nail on the head um, that is important for me. You know, make sure that you're working to improve. It's not enough to just send an email or post something on social media. You've got to start to look at those metrics like you were talking about before mm -hmm. and start to learn what worked for your audience, what didn't work, and try new things to get them to take action to buy more or to interact with you more on social media. Exactly. You, you learn quite a bit from your metrics and your insights and you learn what works, what doesn't and how you can improve so that you make more of an impact the next time. Absolutely. All about improving. All mm -hmm. right. So I see we're actually at just a minute or two past the top of the hour. So, Brian, I want to thank you again so much for joining us and sharing all of this really great knowledge. And uh, we're going to close out of the session and I want to thank all of you as attendees for joining us today as well. Thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Bye now. Stay well. You too. Bye.